everybody. Reporting to you again from the glamour city Hollywood. The idea of offsetting of carbon footprints was created by British Petroleum marketing company in order to come up with a way to persuade people that they were the problem and not the oil companies. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for a show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Dr. Joe Rome, Senior Research Fellow at the University of Pennsylvania Center for Science, Sustainability, and the Media. Welcome to the show today. Thank you, Scott. So for the listeners, just as a background, if I may just mention a few accolades, uh, you're a Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, yes. recognized for your distinguished service toward sustainable energy future. Time Magazine have called you the hero of the environment and the web's most influential climate change blogger. And New York Magazine called your book Climate Change, What Everyone Needs to Know as a single best single source primer on the state of climate change. Now, recently, I believe June of this uh, this year, you've joined the University of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania Center for Science, Sustainability, and the Media as a senior research fellow. And I'd love to just kind of get a sense in terms of what you hope to accomplish in this new role. Sure. Well, this center was launched um, about a year ago, um, with the director being uh, climatologist Michael Mann, who I think uh, is one of the leading climatologists and, and one of the best communicators, and was done jointly with the Annenberg Center at the University of Pennsylvania, which is run by Kathleen Hall Jameson. And the goal was to improve... Uh, communications on both climate science and climate solutions and you know climate solutions is 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 my background uh, uh, having served at the department of energy for five years and helping to run uh, the office of efficiency and renewables and so i'm going to be writing a series of reports that look at many of the major climate solutions that that have been proposed um and see, kind of kick their tires, see, could they scale in the real world? Because there's a lot of things that you can do in a lab or in a demonstration, but that doesn't mean that that at a large scale, the kind of scale that you need for a climate solution, that, that they're viable or that they make sense. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm actually very excited. And, and prior to this uh, conversation, I was just talking to you about inviting you back because we're not going to be able to cover the full gamut in this half an hour segment, but love to have you back to talk about it because I have questions myself, like direct air uh, carbon capture is a great example where it's incredibly CapEx and OpEx intensive. Yes. And is that really a truly globally scalable solution that's going to make any kind of dent whatsoever in terms of not only net zero, but also sequestration? To the level that we actually really need, so lots of lots of questions. Yeah. I'm very excited to um, you know learn and read about your analysis that's upcoming. Now, mid year, you wrote a, a report entitled "Are Carbon Offsets Unscalable, Unjust, and Unfixable, and a Threat to the Paris Climate Agreement?" Now, how would you describe that report, and why do you believe that your co-author of another report, "Carbon Offsets Are Worthless and You Could Get Sued"? Here's what to do instead. How Aspen Ski Company called it one of the most important papers ever published in climate movement and why. Sure. Well, I appreciate that. that, And I'd be delighted to to come back. Uh, These are all uh, somewhat complicated issues, but they're so important, you know, that I've tried to spend a lot of time understanding them and and being able to explain them well. Um, So offsets um, are... Basically, uh, when, um, you know, a company uh, wants to uh, claim uh, reductions of carbon dioxide emissions for itself by paying somebody else somewhere 
in, you know, usually it's a rich company or country paying a, a poorer country to take some action that reduces emissions. And this will have it's sort of a license to pollute by the rich company or rich country so it can keep doing what it what it wants to do. I think most people are exposed to this when they buy an airline ticket and you sort of get that, you know, option. Do you want to spend a few dollars to offset the carbon dioxide emissions that resulted from your airline travel? And, uh, you know, that's usually for tree planting and the like. And this paper, and there's a long history of carbon offsets, many decades. And this paper really looks closely at what has been going on in this offset market. And it basically comes to the conclusion that Carbon offsets, particularly this voluntary market where you go out and buy some tons to offset your emissions or a company does, this it's, it, it has failed. Um, the offsets aren't real and they are overcounted and they have gotten to the point where um, there are all these lawsuits because what happens is when you it, for companies, what companies have been doing is purchasing enough of these offsets to, let's say, cover the emissions from one of their products. And then they call that product climate neutral. So, for instance, you if you buy a bottle of Evian water today, you will see on the bottle it says uh, uh, climate neutral, carbon neutral. And um, it's a kind of a weird claim because – you know, why would how would a bottle of water, you know, be climate neutral? And and the answer is, well, it isn't really, you know, it's still when you produce the, you know, make the bottle out of the plastic and you, you know, uh, manufacture and put the water in and distribute it. Right. That all releases a lot of carbon pollution and simply paying somebody else to reduce their emissions doesn't really make your product carbon neutral. I hope people can sort of see that that it's kind of a pretend thing. And what what the world has to do, and this is sort of why it's very serious, is that in December 2015, the nations of the world in Paris unanimously agreed that they were going to start ratcheting down their carbon pollution to avoid catastrophic climate change. And the goal was to keep warming well below two degrees Celsius, which is 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit, and possibly much lower than that. Um, but the point is, we're going to have to get off fossil fuels. That was the point. That is what the science said, that if you wanted to uh, avoid, you know, keep warming at such a low level, you would have to take global emissions to net zero, right? You would have to reduce emissions in the world as much as possible and offset the rest with these negative emissions, which, you know, you mentioned at the beginning, like direct air capture. But the point is, everybody has to reduce their emissions a lot, you know, a great deal, 90 percent, 95 percent before these other things would ever make sense. So the point is that uh, the problem with offsets is it allows people to pretend that they don't have to reduce their own emissions. But we're now we've dawdled for a very long time on climate change. And if you want to be serious about it, you need to reduce your own emissions. So I love this conversation because, you know, out of, I would say, nine out of 10 guests that we have on the show, you know, climate, I mean, carbon offset oftentimes comes up as a augment or a supplemental or an addendum. And it's a piece of the solution. But I love the fact that we're talking in a very crisp, concise fashion about really just justification, the efficacy of carbon offsets. Yeah. Matter of fact, you go as far as suggesting that carbon offsets are largely worthless and that the other issue that I know you're going to cover is the fact that they're claimed twice. Book yeah. that's reductions in two different ledgers. I, I, want, I mean, does that even make sense? And you mentioned one or a couple of companies already, but about 940 companies have made these pledges, the Paris Agreement towards net zero, yet even the CEO of the United Airlines calls offset pledges as being majority of them are fraud. What's your no, point? it's it's um, uh, everything you said is true. And I, and I think, uh, let's start with the worthless nature of them. Th there was in February 
uh, a major or January, the end of January, Feb early February, a major um, expose by the UK Guardian and the German Dizit, and then this nonprofit called Source Materials. And they have spent nine months looking at uh, carbon offsets that are, were considered very credible, which were carbon offsets to uh, protect the Brazilian rainforest. And, and obviously, protecting the Brazilian rainforest is a, is a very good idea. Um, but what that concluded, and they worked with scientists who recently published that work, that 94% of those were worthless. And uh, this led a number of those companies, because they had been selling those company, uh, those offsets to Disney and Gucci and Shell Oil. So these were, you know, pretty serious companies. And Gucci, for instance, as a result of this, said, we're out of the offset game. We're not going to do offsets anymore. Mm -hmm. And as you say, United Airlines has made statements. And, you know, Nestle's in late June said, we're also, we're not going to be buying offsets anymore. We're withdrawing all of the claims that we've made about carbon neutral products like, like Perrier. And, uh, and we're going to go about the business of reducing our own emissions. So let me just briefly explain like one of the biggest problems with offsets. And in the case of the Brazilian rainforest, you are paying people not to cut down trees. Now, the problem here is you don't know if they were going to cut down those trees, right? So um, it, it gets to this hypothetical or counterfactual, right? A lot of the, the a key part of offsets is you have to prove that the thing you're paying to offset wouldn't have happened anyway, right? If, if it would have happened without you, then your money didn't make any difference and you don't deserve to be able to claim those emissions reductions. Right. Well, when you pay someone not to do something, there's no way of knowing what they would have done. Maybe they would have only cut down half the trees. Maybe they weren't going to cut down the trees at all. They just wanted to get this money. And not only that, if they're a timber company, right, the timber company needs timber, right? So I could pay you not to cut down your forest. But if a forest in a nearby province says, oh, well, I will cut down my forests, right? You haven't solved the problem. This is called leakage, right? The timber company still wants the timber and, and you're being paid not to cut down your forest doesn't deal with the rest of the world. So the problem with these offsets is that you can't really verify them. You can't prove that they would have happened. They wouldn't have happened anyway. Um, another classic example is renewables. Right. It seems like a good idea to support renewable projects. But now solar and wind are the cheapest form of power in many places. So those solar projects would have happened anyway. And someone who says, oh, I chipped in some money to help that project. Well, maybe you chipped in like five percent of the project. Right. But the project would have happened without you. Do you deserve 100 percent of the credit for those emissions reductions? So these are the issues that get involved that you get involved with when you get into this very murky area. And and that's why expose after expose has shown that these things, you can't prove that they're real. And a lot of them would have happened anyway. And a lot of the credits were overcounted or there was this leakage issue or the permanence issue. Right. What if I pay you not to cut down your trees and then there's a forest fire, which seems to be happening a lot more now because of climate change. So trees aren't permanent. So how do you deal with the fact that I'm going to pollute CO2 into the air now where it could last hundreds of years, but I'm going to claim an offset that might last 10 or 20 years? Right. Have I solved the problem or have I just pretended that I've solved the problem and kind of rearranged the deck chairs on the Titanic? So I want to ask you, there are startups and we've had them on our show as well that are working on carbon offsets software. And basically yeah. their their whole claim is that they're able to trace it and they're able to vet it and make sure that it doesn't get double counted. And all the issues that you're talking about, they're able to somehow vet that out and mitigate. Is that credible? Um, I hate to say that it isn't. Um, I, I appreciate that. Um, I, I could tell you what happened and why this happened. Um, the, as you noted, a lot of companies have made net zero commitments. 
and um, a lot of countries have, uh, particularly in the lead up to the 2021 Glasgow Climate Conference um, in November of 2021. And the reason they did that is because, as I said, under the Paris Accord, um, everybody said, we're going to reduce emissions uh, sharply. And a report came out from the UN experts uh, in a couple, a couple of years after that saying, if you want to reduce, if you want to stabilize at this low temperature of warming and avoid catastrophe, you are going to have to go to net zero. So that that net zero became a thing that everybody thought they were going to have to make commitments for. And when they did that, uh, in the lead up to Glasgow, major countries, right, a year before Glasgow, China said, we are going to go net zero in 2060. And over the following 12 months, pretty much every country in the world said, we're going net zero. And as a result, many companies wanting to appear responsible said, we're going to go net zero. So the offset market exploded. It used to be languishing, I say languishing, around 250, 300 million, 350 million dollars a year. And in 2021, it blew up to 2 billion. And it blew up because A, all of these companies and countries were making these commitments, and B, because the speculators said, oh, my God, this market's going to be huge because they're all going to have to meet these net zero requirements by buying offsets. So we're going to join in. So the market soared. Um, at Glasgow, uh, the world sort of decided that rather than doing voluntary offsets, we were going to create an official offset market under the auspices of the United Nations. And this would be so-called compliance market. That is to say, this would be a regulated marketplace. And the UN would enforce some degree of quality standards. And you would have to meet certain conditions. And um, at, so it sort of became clear to some people that the voluntary market, and, and I, maybe I should have made this distinction at the beginning, I apologize, um, th there is a compliance market where you have to do things under law, under a regulation, and there is an independent body supervising that, like uh, a sheriff or an umpire, right, saying this is a real offset and this isn't a real offset. The voluntary market is the wild, wild west. There is no independent body that can say this offset is good and this offset isn't. And it is well known, and, and I had a discussion with a New York Times reporter who wrote, you know, wrote a piece on this, the columnist the column Peter Coy. This is Gresham's Law, which is bad money chases out good money. If you have an unregulated market and I say, I'm going to sell you a good offset and it's going to cost $20 a ton. But someone else says, I'm going to sell you an offset for $5 a ton. Well, there's no one to say mine is good and that one isn't good. So why wouldn't you buy the cheap one? So you get a race to the bottom. This is the, the famous race to the bottom in an unregulated market. And so you can't come in. It doesn't matter if you come in with a great piece of software because nobody has to pay attention to you. And the situation has gotten so bad that um, Qatar set up its own market uh, to issue offsets to the uh, uh, for the specific purpose of issuing offsets to FIFA for the World Cup 2022. Saudi Arabia has set up its own offsets to issue to its uh, offset crediting company to issue offsets to its polluting company so they can claim to be net zero. And, and all I can say to you is that um, it is only the fact that the FIFA, the soccer federation, was which is based in Switzerland, was taken to court in front of the Swiss regulator, the equivalent of their Federal Trade Commission. And their regulator said, you are making misleading claims. You have not proven that these offsets are real. And therefore, you haven't provided any evidence that the World Cup was climate neutral. And therefore, please stop saying so. Mm -hmm. And the British regulator has said the same thing. So, you know, what I'm trying to say is that um, it doesn't matter. And so you asked why were all these companies set up? The market exploded 
in 2021. And all the venture capitalists said, there is a huge market here. And this is now $2 billion. And, and you know, uh, uh, a lot of companies like uh, um, uh, Boston Consulting said, this is going to be a $20 billion market in 2030, right? And McKinsey and all these people said, oh, we can make money in this market. So the venture capitalists said, well, we can disrupt this market. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, a lot of software and other companies were started. But the problem is you can't disrupt an unregulated market if because there's nobody... There's no umpire. There's no sheriff. There's 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 nobody to say this is a good real offset and this isn't a real offset. And no one can come. You can come in with a piece of software that says this. Why should anyone? How are you going to enforce that? Why is anyone going to pay attention to you? They're not paying attention to all the studies that have come out. They don't care about the exposés in the newspapers. There's just too much money to be made. So so let me let me jump in here a little bit because yeah. I, I really appreciate this backdrop. Yeah. And, and it's it's for me, it's, it's a visual backdrop because, you know, as early as, let's say, 2020, the market was still fairly small, two, three hundred million dollars. And then by 2021, it jumps 10x to two billion. You got these big strategy and consulting firms suggesting that it's going to be even 100x fold yeah. in a few years. But then when we look at the, the market now, 2023, that's a very different picture, isn't it? And kind of like what you're alluding to is that I think lawsuits and some of the regulators coming back and basically saying that, hey, look, what you're claiming may not be true. And we've seen the number of losses quadruple in the past year or so. Yeah, Having a correlating effect to that market that you're talking about. And I wonder if we'll ever see that 20 billion, let alone still $2 billion market. Well, I think it's a, I, I think it's unlikely. I, I don't want to say it's impossible because you know we we live in a world where people do a, you know cryptocurrency people people do a lot of things that you might look at objectively and say why is this happening but it still happened, um, and yes, the peak of the offset price was the Glasgow conference was November twenty twenty one and if you if you look at the price of let's say the most popular offsets, which are called the nature-based offsets. That's where I either pay to plant trees or I pay you not to cut down trees. And there are some other nature-based offsets, but those are the two biggest. Those collapsed in price 90% in the subsequent 18 months. And it was a slow and steady process. Partly, there is no question that all of these lawsuits mattered and the exposés. There is no question that the Guardian expose had a very big impact on a lot of companies who said, why am I paying money for offsets that everybody said were high quality, but 94% of them are worthless according to science. So it became a little radioactive. And uh, as you say, lawsuit after lawsuit, there was a lawsuit pub, pub, um, in federal court in June, excuse me, the end of May, uh, suing Delta Airlines because Delta Airlines had been claiming they were the world's first carbon neutral airline. And when you see a Delta jet take off, it seems like it has a lot of emissions. So it's, you know, it's kind of ridiculous for an airline to make this claim. And, and, but it is true that reducing airline emissions may be the hardest thing to do, right? To come up with a fuel, a jet fuel that is zero emissions is definitely difficult. But as you say, you quoted the CEO of United Airlines. It is amazing that the CEO of United Airlines, an industry which has historically been the most dependent on offsetting, say that they're, they, he said two things. He said the majority of them are fraud, and in any case, this is the scalable. You, you can't scale this up to a level that actually matters to the world because at, the low, at this level, they're fraudulent. There's no, you know, there's no there there. And so all of these things happened. The lawsuits, I would say three things or four things happened. The lawsuits started happening. The exposés piled up. The speculators realized, as the market started to come down, the speculators realized, oh, we were wrong, right? This isn't the gravy train. This isn't that we, what we thought was going to happen may not happen. So we're going to get out with whatever profit we have. So that sped things up. Um, and then, you know, uh, responsible companies stepped up 
and said as as you know companies like Nestle's companies like uh, I mean Shell I'm not going to call them responsible but they announced uh, you know in the last uh, uh, several weeks they're getting out of the offset buying business and Gucci said that and so um, and lastly. People realized, I think, the implications of what happened at Glasgow, which is there's going to be an official market for offsets regulated by the U.N. And in a world where there's an official market and it's recognized by the entire world and everybody's greenhouse gas inventories are kept track of, whether you're Switzerland or Brazil, right, in that market, the voluntary market doesn't make much sense anymore. In fact, it's competing and it can't compete with the real thing. Right. If you if you have a real market where the where some independent body says this is an authorized offset, how do you sell something that isn't an authorized offset into the world market at the same time? It doesn't make sense. The scientific literature actually said that that this fake offset actually interferes with the real market and undermines it. So, yeah, I want to get into all the detail. People can, you know, read my report to get into the nitty gritty here. But the point is, uh, and this gets to the double counting issue, which we can come back to. But the point is, if there's a real market, people should work within the real market and get out of this unregulated, unsupervised, uh, well investigated and always found to be dubious market. You know, I, I think that's that's where we are. So I don't think we're going to be getting to a twenty billion dollar a year market, and I think it's going to be hard to get back to the you know to the two billion because um, I just think a lot of people aren't going to play this game anymore, and that is going to make it. Uh, uh, there there are some people who will. You know, because I said, uh, you know, you had uh, uh, offset creditors set up in Qatar. You have an offset company set up in Saudi Arabia and and all those countries can set up those things because they don't really care. But the world of the people who are serious about climate change, I think they get it and they aren't going to participate. They don't want to be sued. Right. It, it isn't good for public relations. A lot of the reasons people were doing this was to get good PR. Right. I'm helping another country reducing emissions, and I'm going to pretend that that means I'm reducing emissions. And that was all great when it was good PR, but a lawsuit is very bad PR. So a lot of companies are like, why should I put money into something that isn't going to help my reputation? And in fact, it might hurt my reputation. So you see, you know, this is a sea change in the perception uh, of the market, and I don't know how that reverses. All right. So... We only have two minutes. Yeah. And I think one of the things that I'm sure that our listeners are thinking about right now, because they're very much committed, they're early adopters of climate yeah. action. And many of them have signed up to everything from you know social networks that say, hey, if you participate in our conversations, we'll actually contribute to carbon offsets. Others are actually dollar cost averaging or actually contributing to programs to specifically to offset. What would you say to those people that are spending real dollars on these markets that are unregulated? I would tell them that they should stop because there is no possible way that they can verify the quality of what they're buying. And the vast majority of what they're probably buying is worthless. Um, but those two are different things, right? I mean, if, if only half of them were worthless, it still wouldn't matter if you couldn't verify there's no one to tell you that you're not throwing away all your money. So I would get out of that market, as many serious companies and others have done. Um, and and by the way, the voluntary market, the, those nature-based offsets, they're currently two dollars a ton. You know, the European trading system, which is where Japan and France, uh, I mean France and Germany, trade tons. You know, to meet the reducing cap on emissions, that is a regulated market. Those are $100 a ton. So if you want to know if you're buying a real offset, the answer is you're going to pay real money for it. And if you're paying $2 a ton, you can pretty much bet that if the climate problem could be solved at $2 a ton, you and I would be talking about something different right now, and I would have a whole different career. That's not the cost of this solution. The cost is much more in the $100 a realm. So people should, if people want to take action, they should either spend the money to 
get a solar panel or, you know, save up money, make sure their next car is an electric car. You know, I don't want to say all these things are cheap. I think electric cars are better and they're becoming cheaper. You know, solar energy on your house can be done cheaply and sometimes with no money down, et cetera, et cetera. You should focus on, you know, reducing your own emissions. But I will make the key point, the problem won't be solved by you solving your own emissions. So you shouldn't feel guilty. You know, the idea of offsetting of carbon footprints was created by British Petroleum marketing company in order to come up with a way to persuade people that they were the problem and not the oil companies. You don't are not under any moral obligation to take your emissions down to zero. I think it's a good idea to get it as low as possible, but you're not the solution to the problem. The solution to the problem is going to be at the government level, right? It could be at the state level, but you know, and it could be companies can reduce their own emissions. But like I said, you you don't have to. Uh, if you want to take action, give money to an environmental group. Right. I mean, there's many things that you can do to support action uh, that are a lot better than than tr- squandering your money on this voluntary market. OK, so we are out of time now. Most of the conversation today was around carbon offsets, but really the other part of the work that you really do is focusing on real world, sustainable, scalable yeah. climate solutions on a truly global scale. And I'd love to have you back to talk about that. Um, yeah. And with that, I have been joined by Dr. Joe Rome, Senior Research Fellow at the UPenn Center for Science, Sustainability, and the Media. Thank you for joining today. Thanks for having me. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.